I'm a fan of your music, so I'm very happy to be doing this conversation, Kevin. And I want to first ask you about something that Virginia Woolf said. And she said, why are women so much more interesting to men than men are to women? And I thought that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> And oh I, gosh, and I, I don't know how, if that's a loaded, oh. I know, but I thought that was an interesting place to start since this is a book that uses Virginia Woolf, you know, as an anchor for the story of these, of these three, uh, uh, you know, uh, of these women written by a man and the opera is written by a man, you yeah. know, as, you know, in terms of libretto and composed by a man. So it's all this male energy surrounding this very, <laughs> very, very female story. So how no. would you answer her question? Well, I don't know, but um, I don't know. I can't answer why, but I would say yes. For me, um, um, women are more interesting as characters. I, I don't know why. You know, I love operas like Billy Budd, and um, you know, I love. I, I don't know. I, there's something about it. Um, you know, I was actually. It's really funny. Just before I talked to you, I I had the t I was flipping in channels around. And just as I was working this morning and the movie Aliens was on, which is like, uh, you know, James Cameron, he had the same thing. James Cameron fascinated with, with female, you know, heroines or heroes in his stories. And, um, you know, uh, I don't know exactly <laughs> why, um, but, uh, you know, these characters are fascinating. And I mean, really, you know, the the idea was uh, came to me from Renee Fleming just in a conversation we were having. And, and I think it was exciting to her um, just because, I, you know, it was, it was on her mind, uh, the idea of the hours um, because she had just had lunch with Julianne Moore and, and she was thinking about it. And, and she thought of the, the, how interesting it would be to have an opera that takes place in three different time periods all at the same time. Um, I like writing for the female voice, for one thing, um, very much. Um, I think I'm, 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 you know, my first opera was basically almost all men. Um, and now I'm starting to get my musical mind around um, having melodies that are, you know, essentially around middle C on the piano, which is a, a different, you know, kind of thing, because then the harmony has to be in a different place, et cetera. I don't want to get too technical, but... But anyway, it's very natural for me to write for 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 women's voices, for one thing. But that is a very <laughs> that's a very Virginia Woolf thing to say, and probably true as well. Uh, no doubt. Um, you mentioned that it, the the novel obviously takes place in three different time periods. So musically, how are those time periods reflected, um, and is that necessary for an audience to stay on course with the story you're telling? Yeah, it, it's it is. I mean, I think it is interesting to for there to be clarity. Um, I mean, the piece has a very kind of otherworldly um, and kind of outside of time, kind of mystical, um, you know, feel to it. But definitely, what we want the audience to know, you know, what's going on. We want to know who they're dealing with at any moment. Um, I didn't, you know, have a real, you know, premeditated idea that there would be three different types of music, which would be extremely different and would signify the different characters. But I think it just happened naturally. Um, I, I kind of created um, kind of like musical environments for um, not really the characters as much as their situations, you know? So, you know, Virginia Woolf, Woolf feels feels trapped in, in Richmond and she wants the, the wildness of the city. And so there's a kind of language, musical language and certain elements of that language, which, which describe that for, for me. There's that and then there's her sort of manic desire for, for London. And so there's that kind of dichotomy in her music. Um, Laura Brown, the, the middle period character, um, uh, living outside of LA after World War II with her, with her husband and, and her young son, her three-year-old son, um, also feels trapped in a sort of alien domestic world that is not natural for her and not she's 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 miserable in it and so there's a way of describing that world like in other words the world that that she can't fit into um which has its own language um and then i think clarissa um you know the the, the um, you know uh, renee fleming's character also has um uh, a kind of musical language was actually sort of, I think if anything, it, it, it's characterized by Clarissa's just eternal optimism and, and you know, 
uh, radiance, you know, that she thinks everything will be fine if we just have, if we just have the perfect party and we get the flowers exactly right and the chairs are just right, then Richard will be fine. And, you know, that kind of, which I think, you know, of course, Renee Fleming can do that really well. I, I think she can, she can exude that kind of energy. So anyway, yes, the, <laughs> the short answer is yes, that there are, are different musical, um, I think I really think of them as like musical environments. They're not like light motifs or anything, but they're, they're languages that I think that um, are associated with the different characters and their situations. And, and then of course, there are also moments that are outside of time and space kind of where the, the you know, two of them or three of them will come together sort of outside of reality. And there's a kind of music for that as well. You know, I have I have to say, if you look at the at the film cast, and you and and not just the three leads, but all the way down the line, I mean, you probably had like the Mount Rushmore of of actors bringing this story to life on screen. I feel like you have the Mount the, the Mount Rushmore of opera sing, of female opera singers in this as well. I mean, obviously Renee was an inspiration for this, but how did this? How did all three of them fall into place? I think Peter Gelb got excited about it. And, you know, if it started with Renee and, and, and then he started thinking, well, let's really, you know, <laughs> who can hold their own, you know, next to Renee and these three characters are, I would, you know, they're, they're pretty equal, I would say in importance in the story. I, I would say Clarissa's part is bigger, um, but yeah, it was his, his idea. And he, you know, he just sort of brought me into his office and, and told me that this was his idea and it was, you know, just surreal. I mean, incredible. Uh, I mean, it was it was intimidating and and uh, you know it was uh, exciting and scary at the same time. Really, for me, did it allow you to to write or to adjust anything that you had written, knowing that their skill sets were the ones that would be bringing this to life? It was yeah. It was very much. Um, written for the three of them because I hadn't you know started anything uh, we hadn't started writing it um, um, yet uh, and so I knew who we, we were writing for um, I knew Renee's voice very well uh, having done um, a couple of projects with her a big piece about Georgia O'Keeffe um, and um, I knew Kelly O'Hara's voice from mainly from the things she does in musical theater. And so, um, but I, so I was sort of talking to her a lot and, you know, and finding out that she actually has an incredible range and she can, you know, sing, you know, lyric soprano roles. And of course I knew Joyce DiDonato's voice. So, so um, yeah, the piece is really, and, and will continue to be written for the three of them over the next several months. We're now just starting to really work on it. I mean, you know, we're, we're having this concert uh, version of it in Philadelphia with Renee and Kelly. Um, uh, Joyce DiDonato is not available for that, but um, I will, I'm sure over the next several months begin to really, um, you know, really kind of sculpt the part or, or that's not the right word for it, but, um, you know, tailor it to her, to her needs. I mean, I really think that's, that's crucial, you know, um, and, and, and opera, to, to make sure that the, the principals, you know, really feel like they can deliver with their parts. And, um, and it's funny that how minute the changes can be sometimes that makes a big difference um, to them. And for me, another, it's actually not such a difficult thing because I'm actually, I think of myself as a harmonist. So in other words, like harmony is the most important thing, you know? And so I have a series of, of, of chords or, or harmonies that the music travels through and that is pretty much I mean once I figure it out it's kind of not negotiable but but as far as what notes you know what notes are sung as part of that harmony there there are a lot of possibilities so it's 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 easy for me and, and actually really satisfying for me to to um, to develop these roles you know in, in in just the parts of their voice that that work given given the situation you know I think one of the reasons I like your music as much as I do is you have used both harmony and melody. And mm -hmm. it seems like, you know, in the 20, you know, in, in this century, certainly, that a lot of people have steered away from melody and harmony. And it's more about soundscapes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and textures and things like that. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. why such old fashioned, which I think shouldn't be old fashioned ideas of melody and harmony, you know, still appeal to you? Uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's kind of inescapable for me. It's not that I, I reject anything. Um, you know, I teach it at the Peabody Institute and 
many of my colleagues are, are, are doing things more similar to what you're describing, I think. And, and you know, most of the students who apply to the school are also, also, you know, doing more, yeah, like sort of experiments in timbre and texture and, uh, you know, uh, different sort of pushing the instruments to, to their limits in terms of, you know, techniques, extended techniques for the instruments. And, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, part of it is, I mean, there's a kind of core to, to who I think I am as a musician and the music that I love and, and the music that I write is, of course, a reflection of, of that music. I mean, I like and respect a lot of music, but there's some that I just feel to my very core and I love deeply. And I think the music that I write just naturally is some sort of reflection of that. Um, and so the, the music that I hear, you know, the music that I sort of, I just play on the piano when I'm composing and I hear in my head um, just is a certain way. I mean, I, I, I can't really fight it. And, and it, it also has something to do, I think also with the artists who I work with, you know, like the artists who come to me, either singers or, or chamber groups or soloists, they tend to be um, people who who do a lot of so-called standard repertoire, but you know they they do some new music, and I kind of know how they want to play and how they want to sing, and I know how they play well and they sing well. I you know I know their their instruments, so to speak, and so part of it is that it's kind of a vicious cycle that I can't escape. <laughs> <laughs> but it, there, there is, it really isn't a matter of like thinking that this is the, my way is the right way. And that, you know, it, it's not that at all. It's, I know, I know how my music is regarded by, by a lot of composers and um, probably critics as well. But I, I just, you know, it's just kind of who I am. Right. Well, and those opinions shouldn't mean anything to you, I assume. Well, I mean, of course, you know, you, you can, you, you know, think of, sometimes you think, gosh, you know, I'm just writing, you know, I, this this the, the strings just play a whole note here, you know, and I, I like the sound of it. Like, shouldn't they be doing all these, you know, harmonics and eff effects and things? And you know, um, because the, that's the music that's around me a lot of the time. Um, but then when I actually sit down to, to do my work and get in the place that you know, emotional space to write, and it just you know, it's I'm, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, I guess. <laughs> What yeah. did you and, and Greg Pierce learn from the session last spring with Cincinnati Opera? I was able to watch some of that online, which which was terrific because with new work, you don't often get a chance to do that. And I'm wondering what you got out of out of that session and how that's informed the work you've done subsequent to those perform to that performance. Oh yeah, I don't even remember, you know, exactly what we got out of it because there was so much, you know, my score was just marked in red, you know, and I just went to work immediately. It's like, there's a kind of sense that when, when, once you figure out what you need to do, you just want to forget the past and like, it never happened, you know? And, and so I, <laughs> you know, the, the piece becomes just what it is. And I, I'm not someone who keeps old versions around or, you know, once I figure out that something, either the pacing of something is not right or, um, there's something awkward in the in a transition um then i just need to figure out what needs to be done um i uh, i think that one of the really crucial scenes in the opera was entirely rewritten i thought that it didn't didn't work entirely it's a complicated scene well, actually a couple of scenes between um clarissa and richard um dialogue dialogue can be uh, you know i find that i need to work really hard at it. Um, it's it's not so difficult to write an aria. It's not difficult to write a kind of, um, you know, a duet or trio or something that's kind of a, a set piece or something or, or a music or an orchestral interlude. That's also comes natural to me. But I actually the dialogue is really interesting because I don't want to just do like a recit style, you know, like like in a Mozart opera, which I love. I'm not criticizing Mozart, but I, I feel the, mo the, the music should not feel like okay now we're and now we're and now it's rested and now and now it's music or you know um i feel like it should all feel like part of a, an inevitable seamless musical flow and there should be real singing in the dialogue and it should but it should flow naturally like a conversation the kind of ebbs and flows and, and or the the ebb and flow of a conversation and the kind of the pauses and the moments when it moves forward and so those 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 scenes um 
some in some ways require the most work um you know for me and i think i think those are uh, a couple of those moments i i reworked after that workshop but that was so helpful i mean you know in the midst of covid that was a heroic thing that they did i mean we we were all in a massive ballroom and there were 12 singers all of them masked in a little in separate plastic booths with like microphones and you know the pianists and the conductor were in the middle of the room and none of us could approach each other um, but we got through the entire opera and we learned a ton from it. So it was just, um, it's a great program they have there in Cincinnati. It really is. Yeah. That space served you guys very well, given mm -hmm. the COVID, given the COVID of it all. How yeah. did Greg Pierce become the person with whom you were going to collaborate on this? Well, um, you know, I, uh, I was trying to figure that out. You know, the, the Met, um, had some ideas, you know, about, about people that, that they had been wanting to work with. Um, and so I started, uh, you know, investigating and, and Greg had only done one opera, uh, fellow travelers, which is really successful opera with Greg Spears. And I, I read the libretto and I, I really liked it. And I also liked the fact that he hadn't done a lot of operas, you know, the fact that he was, he had done work in other areas, screenplays, et cetera. Um, but he had, um, he, 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 showed me some poems that he wrote actually. And I thought, I, cause I need there to be a poetic element um, to, to the language. It's, it's what inspires me. Um, I think that there, there has to be some poetry in the libretto. Um, and, and I liked that and, and his enthusiasm for the hours. It was clear that he had, <laughs> he had been thinking about it for years as a possibility, you know, as an opera. And so our first conversation, it felt kind of like we were already writing it. You know, we were just on, on the phone. I think he was out at Minnesota Opera for fellow travelers and we were just talking on the phone and we were all, it already felt like we were coming up with an approach to it and, and things that we, we wanted to do and things that we didn't want to do. Um, um, so that's it. Yeah, it, it, it just felt natural once I met him. You know, with, a, with any book, you know, and I was, I was reading a conversation between Michael Cunningham and David Hare, and they were talking about this, the scenes from the book that didn't make the movie and, and why they didn't make the movie. Mm -hmm. I would assume that you use even, you, you for an opera, yeah. you use even less than a movie can possibly use by nature of what an opera is and, and, and the time that you have. I mean, unless you're right, unless this is, you know, you know, the ring cycle, which I doubt it. Yeah, is. no, it's not. It's not. It's <laughs> not. Yeah, for sure. It's been really interesting actually to go back and read the novel recently um, because I, I, intentionally uh you know stayed away from it while we worked on this and, and while greg worked on the libretto I, I wanted to just let him you know um do his thing and i, I just don't believe in having too many cooks and, and I, I feel the same i'm the same way about direction and staging and you know i just i tend to feel i just let people do their their work but um there yeah there there are things that had to be had to be taken out because it it just takes longer to sing something you know it, it's um it had to be to be cut down and i think i think the choices greg made are are, are really great i mean i think it um I, I won't go into the details of it i think you know just to sort of leave some mystery to this <laughs> but but uh yeah it, it does require uh that to happen um for sure it's a brilliant it's just a brilliant book for one thing it's you know i i actually read some of it and i i was on my long drives to to teach in baltimore i was listening to some of the book and you know it's just sort of like it's it's just brilliant. It's it's poetic and insightful and um, and really compelling. You know, it's, it occurs essentially in the minds of people. You know, as does Virginia Woolf, uh, as does Mrs. Dalloway, um, and and the way it does that is is so uh, riveting. Really, what kind of pressure do you two feel in giving this opera life, given that? Mrs. Dalloway is so revered, as is the language of, of Virginia Woolf, that The Hours is revered both as a book and a movie for the language that Cunningham and Hare used. Mm -hmm. You know, what responsibility, what challenges do you face in continuing mm -hmm. with a successful telling of this story? Yeah, no, you're, I mean, it, I think it always is the case when, when you're using, you know, um, when you're you're, you're working with a, a property that's really known. It's inevitable, you know, there's gonna be reactions that, well, it's not like this. And I, I love the book and it's too bad that it's not this way and that way. Um, 
It was certainly true of uh, the Manchurian Candidate, which my which was my second opera. It was it's the same kind of challenge. Um, you know, I just I guess I thought about that a little bit before we started, um, but I felt like when I began composing that I was doing things on my own terms and it felt, it just feels different. Like the, just the, the, the nature of, of the piece, I feel like it's, 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 it's its own thing, you know, and it's not going to be, it's, it's not going to be like, you know, it's not going to feel like the book. It's not going to feel like the film. Um, the, the music just kind of does its, does its thing. And I think has its own personality, I hope. Um, uh, but yeah, no, that that's definitely a, a challenge. Um, I think just to you know, and I hope that I hope that people will will listen to it on its own terms. But yeah, it's I I know what you're saying for sure. Well, the nice thing is the book will still exist, independent yeah. of the opera. That's so right. That's if right. People want to go see what the source material was, or, you know, or go back to the film, whatever. They have that option. It's yeah, and I think. I, I mean, you know, what was interesting about it, you know, if I thought, well, there's nothing we can add to this, then there's no way I would have done it. But as soon as Renee Fleming mentioned the, the book, I, I started thinking about the possibilities that can happen on the stage, on an opera stage that cannot happen in a film. You can't split the, 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 the screen in three ways. I mean, it's been done. Or you can't have, in a book, you, you've got, you know, there, the chapters are, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Dalloway, and the next chapter is Mrs. Wolf, and the next chapter is Mrs. Brown. Um, in an opera, you, you can, you can these, these stories can begin to intermingle and overlap, and they can sing duets that transcend time, or trios eventually, and that, that was what was really exciting about it for me. Um, because with in the, with the language of music, you know, and, and, and harmony, um, it's possible to do that. And so that's that's why I wanted to do it. Yeah, if I, I mean, I, I don't think there's any reason, you know, there, there are a lot of stories that are great that I think about all the time, you know, either films or books. And I think, well, what's the point? <laughs> but I think with this, I really thought there was a point. Well, and you also have a great director. I mean, oh, the best. Yeah, so um, great with, with, with visuals. He's so great with everything. I mean, he's he's fearless, you know? I mean, this is a really challenging, um, you know, piece to direct. And he's he, he doesn't really look at it that way. You know, he thinks of it as, as exciting that it's challenging. And um, yeah, so I, I feel very fortunate uh, to, to be working with him uh, on this. Now, it occurs to me that since your second opera, I'm sure was based on the original, man, you know, version of the Manchurian Candidate versus, versus yeah, the, book. the remake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the book versus and also versus the remake, but you have taken two Meryl Streep properties since she was in the remake of Venturian Candidate. Oh, that's true. <laughs> and and now the hours. So I'm wondering what's next, you know, death becomes her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm the right composer, but not a bad idea. Yeah. Oh, she's incredible. I mean, she's just an inspiration. I mean, and, and her scenes in this in this film. That scene in the kitchen with with Lewis, um, you know, she's just you know, unreal. Right. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, I don't know. Uh, yes, I guess that I didn't. I never thought of it actually, but that's true. Yeah. Well, let right. me let me conclude our conversation by asking you about something that Michael Cunningham said in an interview um, when the novel was released, and he said that he felt that he entered into some kind of maturity with the hours, and that was something only he could have written. And I'm wondering if you could, could compare your own thoughts about your perspective of having written this opera at this point in your life and whether you've reached a certain kind of maturity and if only you could have written this. I, I don't feel that I'm the only composer who could have written this, um, but I do think that my, the way I like to approach opera um, is well suited to, to this story. Um, of course, the emotional situations I, I, I live for these, these things as a composer. I live for the moments when I can um, let these situations kind of wash over me and let music come out. I mean, that's, this is why I, why I, I do it. Um, I, I think as far as maturity, I, I think maybe as well, uh, I mean, that, there's also a good parallel with what uh, Michael Cunningham was saying. Um, I feel like I've, I've learned how to write for the voice. You know, when I was asked to do Silent Night and whatever that was 2008 you know i really had done almost no vocal music and so it was 
uh, learning on the job, really. And I feel like now I, I, I understand, you know, how to not only how to write for, for voice and how to set the English language in, in the way I, I want to, that really um, kind of extracts all the musicality that's possible out of it, you know, not just in the long vowels, but in every aspect of the language. I really love to set English as, as a language. Um, but I also I feel like I've, I've kind of tempered my what, what has often been described in Silent Night as a kind of a polystylistic approach. I've, I've, I've sort of tempered that in a way that feels like it's more, um, more cohesive, you know, and, and more kind of all me, uh, even though there are, you know, references to different stylistic um, things that occur in the, in the piece. So, yeah, I feel like it's a good, it was a good time for me to write this opera. Um, so, yeah. Well, since I live in Los Angeles, I'll have to fly to New York uh, to see the op to see the opera. So I'm hoping that, you know, the hours has a future well past the Met and that there will be an opportunity to see it at least on the West Coast or, or for people to see it elsewhere. I, I hope so, too. You know, one never knows. We're still working on it and we hope for the best. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for your time, Kevin. I really appreciate it.